Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the February Zoom Citrus Workshop. Thank you for joining us. First, I would like to thank Alison Walton from the Immokali IFS Center for her help and cooperation. Today's programs offer one CEU for pesticide license renewal and one CEU for certified crop advisors. If you need CEUs, email me your name, email address, and license number. Today's program will focus on citrus pest and management in traditional citrus groves and cups, which is citrus under a protective screen. Our guest speaker is Dr. Jawad Qureshi. He is an associate professor in entomology at the UF IFAS Southwest Florida Research and Education Center in Amakali. Dr. Qureshi will provide knowledge and understanding of the pests which attack citrus crops in the traditional open citrus groves and under citrus protective screens. This includes the recognition and monitoring of pests and beneficial organisms, as well as management of the pests using cultural, biological, and chemical methods of control, particularly for Asian citrus salad. A broader perspective with a new look at the entire growth operation must be taken to come up with feasible and comprehensive plans to manage citrus growth. Integrated pest management, which is IPM, based on growth scouting to determine the need and proper timing for pesticide applications is very critical. Scouting should become a common practice for citrus growers and production managers. Scouting not only helps citrus growers control pests more efficiently, but also lowers the use of pesticides and the chance of pesticide resistance and contamination. Dr. Qureshi, it's all yours. Please go ahead. Well, thank you very much, Manji. And uh, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, joining the seminar. Uh, when we talk about citrus production in Florida, uh, growers uh, in the state were used to uh, growing citrus uh, normally uh, in the open orchards, uh, relying heavily on the biological control and some selective insecticides. Uh, however, uh, with the discovery of uh, the insect named Asian citrus in 1998, uh, and the disease that it vectors, Huang Long Bing or citrus greening, uh, which was identified in 2005, uh, changed the situation uh, to the point uh, that now it's uh, even not possible to grow a citrus tree into production phase uh, without uh, getting infected with, uh, with Huang Long Bing disease. So that's why uh, we see uh, this transitioning, as you see here in these pictures, uh, uh, these individual protective covers or tree defenders uh, uh, with the objective to protect the trees from this vector and disease uh, in the early year of the production uh, and uh, to increase their chances of survival uh, or uh, transitioning into these larger structures, uh, protective structures, which are called cups, uh, citrus under protective screens, uh, so that uh, basically the crop can be grown all the way from a young tree uh, to production and, and for several years. Uh, so, but still the majority of uh, the acreage uh, belongs uh, in the traditional uh, open orchards uh, here in Florida. So, so today I'll be uh, sharing some of the work uh, that we have been doing 
uh, in all these systems uh, to improve uh, our understanding of, uh, of the pests that colonize citrus crops uh, and uh, their management. So these are uh, some of the important pests uh, that, uh, that colonize citrus crops. Of course, Asian citrus salad is the one uh, uh, that is most important. Uh, it's widespread, the disease is widespread across the state. Uh, so that's why it's the prime importance. Uh, but then we also get the scales, aphids, millibugs, uh, white flies, uh, and sting bugs or leaf-footed bugs under the second group. Then we have mites, uh, rust mites and spider mites are, are important. Uh, then citrus leaf miner is another pest uh, which is spread uh, almost throughout the state. And it is associated with another disease which is called uh, citrus canker. And then we have other pests such as thrips, fruit flies and weevils. So some of them could be region specific or, uh, or field specific, uh, uh, but not as widespread as the Asian citrus psyllid and Hong Long Bing. So that's why uh, that is currently our, our primary target. And in the short run, uh, it's, uh, it's important uh, and probably it, it will remain important even if we come up with the uh, resistant or tolerant plants, uh, that, uh, that we manage this pest, the Asian citrus psyllid in mature uh, and young citrus uh, uh, to keep them viable and towards sustainability. Uh, and and, and with, with this objective, we want to reduce the inoculum of the disease and its spread because if you let this vector uh, increase uh, and, and don't put, put too much effort on the control, uh, it will be totally impossible uh, to produce uh, uh, young trees and bring them into production. So then we have uh, different uh, multiple habitats. If, if we think about the open production systems, uh, uh, we have uh, conventional uh, uh, production as well as the organic, uh, and, and then also uh, the pest management needed in those uh, uh, different habitats because of the different uh, requirements there. So in the long run, uh, by having different tools, uh, either cultural, biological, or chemical, or protective uh, production systems, basically we are looking in the long term toward sustainability of uh, agricultural and horticultural enterprises, uh, conservation of the resources. Uh, it could be uh, 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 insecticide because we don't want to uh, lose some important mode of actions by, by extensive use and issues of pest resistance. Uh, at the same time, we don't want to lose biological control because of the extensive use of the insecticides because this serves the purpose against several pests and not only in citrus, but uh, against a range of uh, other crops as well. Uh, so overall, uh, the idea is that we can uh, promote and develop economical and environmental friendly approaches uh, to the pest management. So uh, for today, uh, I'll, I'll cover the traditional uh, open orchards, uh, the work that we have been doing uh, uh, using foliar sprays of insecticides uh, in the mature citrus and, uh, and how it impacts the Asian citrus salad. Uh, some uh, information on the biological control, uh, its impact on, on psyllid populations and the uh, indicators associated to uh, causing that nature mortality. Uh, then we have uh, young tree production on UV metallized reflective mulch. And uh, we will look at the impact that uh, mulch is having on, the, on those young uh, citrus trees. Uh, and then under protective uh, systems, uh, I'll uh, uh, discuss and, and show some uh, information and data on the individual uh, protective covers, uh, which are also called mini cups or tree defenders, uh, and uh, also citrus. Uh, so, so these are these are the topics uh, uh, that uh, I will cover uh, in, in today's uh, uh, presentation. Uh, Irrespective of uh, what system we are talking about, 
uh, traditional or a protective system. Uh, monitoring is uh, critical. Uh, you need to be out there uh, looking for, uh, for these pests uh, in, in order to assess their presence and, and, and level of uh, intensity uh, so that uh, uh, you can uh, make decisions to manage them. And uh, these are some of the tools which probably already familiar, uh, such as you need to be carrying uh, a magnifying lens uh, so that you can uh, see some of these small insects, uh, several of them uh, colonize these young shoots. So uh, you, you will uh, need uh, a magnifying lens to, to look for them, such as for the immature of Asian citrus salad, uh, even leaf miner, uh, larvae, or aphids and, 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 and those kinds of pests. Uh, then you need a yellow sticky card. Uh, and those are used in different crops and also in citrus for monitoring the populations of uh, different pests, including uh, the Asian citrus salad. Uh, then we have a tap sampling method, uh, which I developed a couple of years ago. Uh, it is just a very simple method. Basically, you have a laminated white sheet uh, on a clipboard. Uh, which you place at random locations under the branches, and then you tap those branches uh, with a piece of uh, PVC pipe, and the insects that fall onto the sheet can be counted, uh, like Asian citrus salad or weevils, or even some of the beneficials such as lady beetles, and and you can get a quick estimation of uh, of the information that is needed uh, compared to some of like sticky cards where you put them out for. Uh, a certain period of time, then you need to bring back and check them uh, in some cases under the microscope. So uh, to, to, so that tap sample kind of saves you from those, uh, those issues if, if you need some instant information and can be done uh, more effectively. Uh, then we have uh, pheromone traps, uh, such as for a citrus leaf miner. Uh, uh, they are very useful and, and provide you a very good activity uh, on the of that pest uh, of the males, uh, and and you you can you know when when the populations uh, start to arrive, and and they can be used both in the in the traditional systems as as well as uh, under the protective production systems, and we have been using them uh, under cup systems for the for the past several years. So for those of you uh, who are not uh, well familiar with the Asian citrus salad. Uh, uh, this insect is, is a small, uh, uh, the adults are about uh, two millimeter. Uh, they lay several hundred eggs in newly developing uh, buds and shoots. Uh, so it has a strong relationship uh, with the phenology of the tree. So, so taking that into consideration when uh, developing the management is, is very critical. Uh, and, and we have in the past, we have uh, developed tools uh, such as dormant sprays uh, uh, which we investigated and, and provided to the industry that if the growers can target the insecticide sprays uh, during the winter period, uh, when most of the trees are not producing the new growth and most of the adult salads are overwintering, uh, then they can target those adult populations and knock them around real well uh, so that when the spring growth comes up, uh, there are few to enter into uh, that uh, uh, new growth and increase their populations. Uh, so as they develop, uh, they go through uh, uh, five nymphal instars uh, of, uh, in the nymphal stage. And here you can see the mature nymphs on the screen, and then uh, they uh, transform into uh, adults again. So the whole life cycle, depending upon the temperature, takes about uh, three to four weeks, and there are several generations uh, during the year. So uh, from 2014 and uh, 2000, uh, to 2018, uh, we did some large scale uh, field studies in Valencia oranges uh, and, and tested uh, different organic programs uh, and a conventional program. Uh, the organic programs were organic insecticides by, by themselves or in rotation with an insecticidal soap, uh, which is called MPEAT, or in rotation with a horticultural uh, mineral oil. Uh, so these programs, we were using a treatment threshold of 0 0.1 adults per tap sample, which was very low. And uh, uh, 
basically when we were hitting an average of 0.1 silit per tap sample based on several that we were doing in those experiments, uh, we will go ahead and make a spray application uh, in, in those programs. Uh, so with that strategy, uh, we were able to keep uh, silit populations uh, in at least two of the organic programs and the conventional program uh, well below uh, the threshold of uh, 0.2 uh, per tap sample, uh, which, is, which is reasonable. Those populations, considering that now the disease is spread throughout the state and uh, uh, the option of totally eliminating them from the field is not there, uh, keeping them at low populations at 0.2 silets per tap sample in that range uh, is, is, is reasonable. So, so we were able to achieve that uh, uh, with, uh, with sprays of, uh, I would say, uh, five to six sprays during the year, uh, uh, which was much better than uh, what uh, the industry went through. Uh, at some point, we were using uh, up to 12 sprays uh, during the year. And it was also encouraging from, from these studies that we found out that there were some tools uh, that we have some organic tools that can be used uh, specifically for the organic growers, uh, but at the same time, that those providing an option uh, which uh, conventional growers can integrate into their programs and uh, reduce the stress just from the uh, application of uh, uh, conventional uh, insecticides. However, uh, there is always uh, uh, further in the research, as you know. So, so we, we, we have been, for the last few years, uh, we have been working uh, uh, with an other idea, again, uh, considering uh, the tree phenology uh, in, into account, uh, basically trying to see uh, uh, the same kind of same concept that we had with the dormant sprays, uh, that if we can target uh, the citrus flushes, uh, because that's where the population of Asian citrus psyllid uh, are concentrated uh, when the flush comes up. So if, if we can target around those period, uh, then, then we can get uh, uh, more, more reductions in, in psyllid populations uh, and, and may be able to uh, even save an application or, or, or more. And, and this product, uh, project was uh, uh, originally led by Dr. Jean uh, Albrego uh, uh, from uh, uh, Lake Alfred Research Center, unfortunately. Uh, 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 he passed away and, and not with us anymore. Uh, but but we, we did it for the last uh, two or three years between uh, myself here at uh, SwiftRec and uh, Dr. Lucas Stelinski and Lauren Dippenbrock uh, at Citrus Research and uh, uh, Education Center uh, in, in Lake Alfred. So here, uh, uh, the work that I'm showing uh, that we did here in the Collier County uh, uh, these were large blocks uh, of Valencia on Swingle Orange. Uh, so there were about 70 acres where we uh, sprayed on uh, in relation to when the flush was uh, 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 becoming available in those blocks. And then there was a grower standard, uh, which our collaborator, collaborating grower was applying according to uh, his program. So then we also have even larger blocks of uh, Valencia on Carrizo uh, uh, orange. And uh, those blocks were uh, 140 acres for the flush time sprays and about the same acreage uh, for the uh, grower standard. Uh, so then we were collecting data on different aspects uh, on particularly on the vector side, uh, the psyllid adult populations, uh, as well as the eggs and uh, and the nymphal populations as well. So we did these studies uh, uh, started in 2020 uh, and, and did in 21 uh, and, and part of 22 as well. I am showing the data only for uh, 2021 um, because of the time constraint and other uh, subjects that I have to discuss, but it, it proves the, uh, the concept uh, uh, that we were trying to investigate. Uh, these were the spray applications uh, that were made uh, in the grower standard and in the flush timed uh, uh, sprays. Uh, you see, you can see the air insecticides and the times when they were spray. For the flush timed sprays, uh, we were uh, basically suggesting them to spray 
uh, as the flushes were uh, coming up. Um, uh, and uh, the target in those times, uh, ideally, uh, the intention was that we spray uh, when the buds start to come out and uh, the very young uh, shoots start to develop and then do another spray during that flush time within three to four weeks period. But that was always not, uh, not possible to synchronize with the grower operations and all that. But at least we were able to make our applications in those flush time sprays during the spray timings. And, and you do see uh, the effect of uh, that tactic and strategies down below. So here we are uh, looking at the number of adult sillards per tap sample. Uh, the orange bar is the one where the sprays were timed to the citrus flushing, uh, whereas the blue bar is the one uh, which uh, the grower was applying according to his program. And, and you can see a huge reductions uh, in, in both, uh, both set of comparisons, the, the blocks uh, on the Valencia and Swingle Orange and, and the blocks uh, in Valencia on, on Criso Orange. Uh, you, can, you can see the bar here, it was uh, almost close to zero uh, in most instances. Uh, in this set, it was uh, uh, relatively high, uh, but still uh, much less compared to the, to the grower uh, standard. So in, in this first scenario, uh, the populations average about 0 0.14 uh, sillards per tap sample uh, in the grower program and only 0 0.009 uh, sillards per tap sample uh, in, in the flush time spray program. Uh, it was similar situation here, about 0.1 uh, adults per tap sample in the grower standard and 0 0.04 uh, adults per tap sample in the in the flush time uh, sprays, and those suppressions were uh, significant, and then they also translated into uh, their production uh, of uh, eggs and further development of the of the nymphal populations, uh, which you can see here. Uh, again, uh, you you can see the grower standard uh, in both situation and you can see the populations of uh, uh, in, in, the, in the blocks that where the sprays were targeted on, on the flush. Uh, and in that case, there were about, uh, in the grower standard, there were about uh, two eggs per flush uh, during the season. And in, in our uh, flush time spray blocks, it was uh, around uh, 0.3 uh, eggs uh, per flush, uh, which, which is very low. Same situation for uh, the nymphs per shoot. Uh, uh, again, you see here, and uh, in this case, uh, the, in the grower standard, uh, there were about on average uh, two nymphs per shoot, uh, whereas uh, in the blocks that were uh, sprayed on, uh, sprays were conducted on the flush, uh, it was about 0.1 nymph uh, per flush. Uh, whereas in the Valencia on Criso, uh, it was about, in the grower standard, it was about four nymphs uh, per flush on the average, uh, whereas uh, only 0.6 nymph uh, per uh, flush uh, in, in the flush time spray uh, uh, blocks. So, so huge reductions and uh, we also looked uh, in, in these blocks of the a yield of those trees, uh, but here it's important to remember uh, that these were, are, are old, uh, mature trees, uh, heavily infected uh, with the disease. So it's not only the vector control uh, that matters at this point, because there are uh, several other factors uh, that contribute uh, to, to what you get out of those trees. But we definitely wanted to uh, collect the data and see uh, if, if there was any impact. Uh, and on Valencia, on, on Swingle, uh, uh, we did see that uh, there was uh, uh, improvement, at least in 2021, uh, uh, there were uh, 1,507 pounds uh, uh, in the per 10 trees in the blocks uh, where the flushes uh, uh, were targeted with the sprays uh, compared to uh, uh, 1,346 pounds 
uh, in the grower standard. So it's, it's not huge differences, but I, I just want to make a point here that for these programs uh, to become effective, these, needs, these programs need to run for a couple of years before you start to see the real impact. And, and that was exactly the case uh, where the previous slide that I showed you from 2014 to 2018, when we were testing uh, organic programs and conventional programs, uh, it was after three years uh, when we started to see that yield effect. And it was very interesting, but in that situation that we did see that one of the organic program actually produced the yield equal to a conventional program and sustained it for two years. So again, it's, it's important that if, if these programs are run for a couple of years, uh, then these differences start to become uh, more obvious. And, and we see that in 2022, there was uh, uh, not much difference. And also the yields in both blocks kind of uh, somewhat declined. And again, like I mentioned, uh, these trees are heavily infected. And especially uh, the collaborators where we were working with uh, were also uh, closing things in, in, in that particular grove, uh, and, and which, which happened later on. So probably the other horticultural and nutritional requirements uh, we were not certain to what level those were being met. Uh, but we, again, uh, in 2022, uh, uh, it was not uh, possible to get the data from the grower standard uh, uh, in 2021 from the grower standard uh, blocks, but we did get uh, from uh, our uh, flush time spray blocks, and it was 841 uh, pounds per 10 trees. Uh, in 2022, the data was available from both uh, situations. And again, we see that uh, the yield was uh, better uh, in the one where sprays were conducted on the flush uh, compared uh, uh, to the grower uh, standard. So now uh, I'll talk about uh, biological control. Uh, you have seen that irrespective of what uh, chemical control method or strategy uh, we are using. Uh, it's, it's not uh, happening that we are totally eliminating the populations. So there are always residual populations and across the landscape, landscape there is a variation in the populations and, and we need the beneficial organisms uh, uh, to further cause mortality and reduce the populations of Asian citrus psyllid. And so here we uh, just show you some of the predatory groups like lady beetles, spiders, and lacewings uh, uh, that are common in the, in the groves. Uh, and, and we have shown uh, uh, multiple times that they significantly contribute to the mortality of uh, Asian citrus psyllids. Uh, then there are also commercially available predators, uh, which my lab has been working for past several years, uh, testing their potential uh, to see that if we have candidates that can be uh, used as well uh, uh, for further uh, improving the biological control. And the, the good thing about uh, most of these predators is that they are generalist. So they are not only, like I said before, they are not just only attacking the Asian citrus psyllid, uh, but they are also attacking a wide range of other insects, which I showed uh, that are available uh, in indoor in, in the citrus groves or, or in the other habitats. So, so some of these lady beetles, which are very common, so you see their adult stages here and, and their young one are the larval stages uh, right next to them. And, and they attack aphids, mites, scales, uh, millibugs, uh, leaf miners, uh, a wide range of pests. And there are several that probably I have not listed uh, that they go after. So uh, this data, um, it comes from uh, uh, one of my graduate uh, student, Jean Burris, uh, who graduated recently, uh, a master's student. Uh, and, and he was conducting these uh, cohort studies. Uh, in his, his project was uh, to study uh, the response of the Asian citrus psyllid and uh, its biological control uh, in, in different uh, tree density plantings in citrus, as that is another trend that is happening in the industry, uh, moving toward high density plantings. So, but overall, uh, what he was doing was he was uh, uh, 
uh, caging the colonies of uh, the Asian citrus salad immatures, eggs, or nymphs, and then uh, leaving the uh, other colonies uncaged uh, without any protection to see how the biological control, how these beneficial uh, insects contribute to the nature mortality of uh, those developing colonies of uh, immatures. And through his work, what we did see was that there was an average of about, I would say, 50 to 70 percent uh, in the uh, mortality uh, in, in those colonies that were exposed to the natural enemies, uh, which, which is a quite, uh, I would say, a, a good uh, contribution, although not as high as uh, we saw a uh, couple of years ago when greening was identified here in the Florida. Uh, at that time, uh, I did a seminal study here in the Southwest, uh, and we did find uh, uh, more than 90% and up to 100% uh, mortality in those nymphal colonies uh, from uh, predators and these uh, lady beetles, lace wings, and, and other predatory groups. Uh, obviously, uh, we have been on a treadmill of uh, insecticide use uh, due to the HLB for the last uh, almost two decades. And, and that significantly impacted some of these uh, beneficial organisms. But still, uh, we see that they are around and, and they are making contribution uh, to the mortality of uh, this insect. Uh, so these are uh, those four uh, lady beetle species that uh, Jean found, Olavi nigrum, uh, the, these uh, orange sections of these pie charts you see, and then and the green sections are the Crinus corallius. And, and, and those species were uh, dominant, uh, followed by uh, um, Cyclonida singuina, this uh, purple color here, and uh, Harmonia xeridus, the, the black sections. And uh, so it, it's good to see that those, those organisms are still in, in those environments and contributing. Uh, just want to make a point here that how these habitats and the new pests uh, impact these beneficials. Olavi nigrum, uh, is one of the species that was not very common in Florida citrus groves. So after Asian citrus salad invaded Florida in 1998, there was huge increase that was seen in the population of uh, this lady beetle into citrus grove. And it was one of the leading species uh, targeting the, the salad population. So these were kind of the first responders uh, when, when salad invaded uh, uh, Florida citrus. Uh, another group of uh, beneficial organisms uh, are the lacewings and the Chrysoperla and Sarucrysa are the two uh, genus that are important. And they are also voracious feeders of uh, the uh, Asian citrus salad as well as uh, several other pests. Uh, one of my postdocs, uh, uh, Gabriel Rugno, he has been working uh, on these for the last couple of years. Uh, uh, he was one of uh, on one of the projects where we were testing uh, different integrated pest management programs against the Asian citrus salad. And one of the uh, objective was to look at the abundance of these lacewings in those programs. And, and we did find three or more species, uh, but the most abundant was uh, the Sarocrysa cubana, uh, these uh, uh, the green bars that you see here. Uh, and it was interesting that they were even abundant uh, in the programs, the IPM programs, uh, where we had uh, conventional insecticides uh, uh, as well. And so it, it is likely that uh, uh, we always talk about the tolerance or uh, resistance in the Asian citrus salad uh, to the insecticides that we have been using to all these years. Uh, and it's very likely, and it, is, it has been shown in the other systems, uh, that these, these beneficials, some of them, uh, may have developed uh, those tolerances uh, to some of those insecticides as well. So now shifting gears to the young citrus on uh, UV metallized uh, uh, reflective mulches. Uh, the idea here being that if, if we plant these young trees on uh, these metallized reflective mulches, uh, we can reduce the colonization rate of uh, the Asian citrus salad on these trees. So uh, when, when the light falls on, on these uh, reflective mulches and gets reflected, 
the Asian citrus cichlid being a day flying insect, uh, when it tries to colonize, it gets confused and uh, not able to colonize uh, at the rate uh, which will happen on a bare ground. So you, you, you will see the decrease in the populations of uh, Asian citrus cichlid uh, on these trees. Uh, this, this work was originally initiated by uh, my predecessor, uh, Dr. Phil Stensley, and uh, uh, its, its impacts were shown. And uh, now uh, uh, we, we are doing this work uh, in uh, uh, three parts of the state here in the Southwest in Immokalee, uh, then in the Lake Alfred where Davy Kadiam Bakini and uh, uh, Lauren Dippenbrock are, uh, are involved in handling. And then we have a, a, a trial in Vero Beach area as well, which I am also uh, uh, organizing and, and taking care of. So uh, we, we did publish an article uh, in, in Citrus Industry uh, uh, back in 21, uh, uh, fall of 21. So if, if you need more detailed information, you can find. But basically, uh, uh, we, we were seeing uh, reductions uh, in the cellular populations, as I said. Uh, the mulch was providing, you can see here, uh, uh, Lake Alford and Immokalee, uh, almost more than 50% uh, reductions. Uh, although it's not obvious here for that particular data set, uh, but we have definitely seen uh, reductions in Vero Beach uh, area as well, uh, not only in the adults population, but also in the uh, immatures uh, uh, populations uh, as well. Uh, so the mulches that were used were uh, uh, 96 inches wide, uh, which were wider than, than the mulches that were previously used uh, uh, when initially those mulches were uh, tested. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show data from the Vero Beach area because those were grapefruits and, and we were able to get yield data also so that you can see the impact of the mulch uh, translating into the final product as well. Although as entomologists, we, we are more concerned with the vector part, uh, but it's always uh, good to tie that uh, to, the, to the final product because that's what uh, matters at the end of the day. So here you can see the, the pictures uh, of the trees uh, that were on the mulch. Uh, you can see the huge thick canopies uh, compared to the trees uh, that were on the bare ground. Uh, and this was uh, a ray rupee, uh, ruby red grapefruit on US 897 rootstock. And here you can see uh, and the diameter of the rootstock uh, and the cyan. And those trees were planted uh, sometime in 2020. And you can see that consistently uh, there was uh, growth, uh, much more growth uh, in the trees that were on the mulch uh, compared to the bare ground. Uh, same situations on the on the cyan data meter uh, diameter, uh, and and that shows you that uh, that the mulch. Uh, so all the combination of any other uh, uh, advantages that uh, that it provides in terms of soil moisture and all that and vector control, all that was ultimately uh, contributing to producing uh, better and more uh, healthy trees. Of course, I I I, I should mention. Uh, that these trials were uh, impacted by the hurricanes that, that we had uh, during these, uh, uh, these recent years, uh, which uh, definitely impacted uh, the mulch uh, beds as well and, and some damage to, to some trees in, in those uh, experiments. Uh, recently, we were able to uh, uh, get the first uh, the harvest of, uh, of those trees. Uh, and, and you can see the differences here. Uh, those were significant differences. Uh, we are looking at the fruit uh, weight per, uh, per tree, uh, which was uh, more than uh, two, two times more than what we were uh, getting on the bare ground. Uh, and also in terms of uh, number of fruit uh, per tree, uh, it was also uh, double on the trees that were on the mulch uh, compared to the uh, bare ground. So this uh, trial uh, here at our research center, uh, uh, Southwest Florida Research and Education Center, this is uh, Valencia on Swingle. Uh, and you can see here uh, 
and the trees here on the mulch and, and here on the, on the bare ground. And uh, you can see uh, the difference again, the dark and, and thick canopies uh, compared uh, to, to not so good uh, trees on the, on the bare ground. Uh, this is also a, a more than two acre block uh, and uh, we have about uh, 450 trees uh, uh, in, in this study. So again, looking at, uh, at uh, some of the growth parameters, uh, I should uh, mention here uh, that uh, in this study, uh, uh, I was also interested in looking at the effect of those uh, individual protective covers uh, that I introduced on my uh, first slide. And, and you will see those uh, as you drive across the state. Uh, growers are implementing those to protect the young trees uh, during the early years from the Asian citrus salad and HLB. So, so we had uh, that, uh, those uh, as part of this experiment well, and, and you can see them installed here at uh, different locations in this trough. So here we are looking at the, again, the growth parameters. We have the root stock diameter uh, and uh, the scion diameter and, uh, here. And uh, again, significant differences uh, between the mulch and the bare ground, uh, not, not here initially. And I think it, they were not significant, but later on uh, they were significant, although not at the magnitude that you will see uh, from the trees that were protected with the IPCs or the individual uh, protective covers uh, for about three years. So the trees that were protected totally from uh, the Asian citrus salad and HLB uh, was showing uh, some amazing results in, in terms of growth. And I will show you some, share with you some pictures uh, on the following slides, uh, which will probably tell you the story better uh, compared to the uh, data. So here uh, you can see uh, the trees that are uh, marked with the arrows uh, were the ones uh, that were the covered uh, with individual protective covers. Uh, so we had uh, these trees planted uh, toward the end of 2019 and uh, immediately they were covered with the IPCs are the individual protective covers um, and uh, which were left for about two years. And then the can canopies were growing out of uh, those in initially used uh, IPCs. So then we removed those and we put larger uh, IPCs on these uh, trees, uh, which, which remained for uh, close to a year uh, when the, the recent hurricane cause significant damage, and then we uh, totally uh, remove those uh, IPCs. So, so you, can, you can see here uh, the huge differences in the canopies, uh, the, the almost double or in more certain situations than the canopy of the tree uh, that were on the bare ground. Uh, you can look at the uh, condition of the leaves. If you go and take a closer look, uh, the leaves are much larger compared to the trees on the bare ground, uh, very thick canopies, dark green leaves. Obviously, as soon as you take those covers off and the uh, cellar start to colonize them, those trees are going to get infected and you will get the positive PCRs, but they definitely are in much better shape uh, and to go through uh, next uh, couple of years uh, compared to the trees uh, that were on the bare ground. And here uh, you can see some more effect. As I said, we have not harvested uh, uh, in this block yet, but you can see here uh, a picture on the left side uh, of uh, your screens. Uh, you can see the fruit on those trees that were covered with the IPCs and now uh, producing a size of the fruit, the maturity and, and the number that is found uh, and, and those, uh, we did some rough estimates just based on what is there on the fraud, some counting. And, and like I said, we, I still want, don't want to use uh, until we get the yield data, uh, but uh, there was almost uh, twice the number of fruit uh, on those trees uh, compared uh, to the trees uh, on the bare ground or on the, on the mulch. 
uh, it's important to, to understand that all these systems uh, uh, that we are testing and implementing, uh, they are not foolproof systems. So please don't think that you have uh, placed the protective covers on the trees uh, and, and you are done. Uh, it's important that, that we monitor these, uh, these structures from time to time uh, to make sure that some of the other pests that I mentioned uh, are not somehow able to get in and, and cause damage to those trees. Because once they are in, they are protected from the biological control and they can even cause more harm compared to what they will cause uh, outside. So this trial uh, that I am doing, and then I am also involved with, the, uh, with the, uh, Dr. Fernando Alfarez here at the research center and some trials on the East Coast uh, uh, with one of the previous uh, horticulturists, Dr. Johnny Ferrarizzi. And, and we have seen from time to time uh, that the one thing for sure that we have seen is that uh, we have not seen the Asian citrusoid or HLB so those trees definitely were protective uh, from uh, those uh, vector and the disease. But then uh, you may see scales or millibugs, mites, leaf rollers. And, and to our surprise, uh, we did see uh, a garden army worm, uh, which you would not even think of. You, you see the larvae here, these uh, large size larvae. So in, in, in some instances, they were developing uh, inside uh, those uh, IPCs. And, and the way this happens is that the moths will come and lay their eggs here. You can see an egg batch with the red circle on it. Uh, they lay their egg batch on the outer surface of those uh, IPCs. And once they hatch, if the larvae found a hole in those IPCs, or they, they are not uh, tied well at, at the base, they will be able to crawl in and cause huge damage uh, to those trees. Uh, before you even notice. So that's why it is important. So then you can also get uh, snow scales or some other scales uh, populations uh, or millibugs developing in those uh, uh, IPCs as well. So, so monitoring is important and key to all these systems. So now uh, shifting gears to the citrus under protective screens. Uh, those big structures, are, uh, they are designed and being implemented uh, to produce uh, citrus uh, under cover uh, all the way to production. Uh, and uh, that's even more important for the fresh fruits uh, where quality is uh, even more uh, important uh, compared to the processed fruit. So it is uh, at this point, probably it's it's more uh, uh, with those growers or or them uh, trying these more uh, compared to the to the the groves destined for the processed markets. Uh, but at least at this point, I would say between close to I think uh, one thousand acres uh, <clears throat> are under uh, these uh, cups, uh, and the, the growers uh, are are implementing them and and. Uh, uh, trying with uh, with those uh, crops. So the idea is that the, the, the Asian citrus salad will not be able to enter these structures. And that means uh, producing citrus without long, long being or citrus greening disease. So these structures uh, were established uh, on the uh, at the Indian River Research and the Education Center in Fort Pierce uh, back in 2013. So a lot of data being collected. Uh, and uh, I have a project with Dr. Arnold Schumann uh, in Lake Alfred. And uh, I am working uh, for the last uh, four or five years in these structures as well. So we have those structures and then the open air control, <clears throat> which are not covered and exposed to the psyllid and the disease. Uh, so these are rare ruby grapefruit uh, on two rootstocks. Uh, US 897 and sour orange. And then uh, there were two plantings there in ground and uh, water trees. So we have been collecting data on all the pests, uh, uh, either Asian citrus, leaf miners, scales, millibugs, uh, uh, to get uh, as much information as we can uh, in, in those. And uh, this data, just to show you, 
uh, that how good these structures are in terms of protecting from the Asian citrusylid and HLB. So this is some recent data from 2020 and 2021, and we have similar data for 2022. You can see huge populations in this top figure of uh, Asian citrusylid in both years. And the down below, uh, you see that there were few cilids that were found in one year, uh, but generally there were no cilids in those structures. And even those you can get uh, sometimes when, when, when you get uh, some damage from a storm uh, and, and that, uh, that damage or that uh, those holes uh, remain exposed for some time, and the cilids may get a chance. And also there is a lot of traffic, uh, people going in and out for, for work and collecting data and all that. So it is likely that you may get uh, a few adults there, uh, but we only found them on, on the sticky cards uh, and that never translated into infestation in the trees uh, where you see the colonies of immatures developing on those trees. Uh, and that's why uh, no disease as well, even despite some of those incursions, because there was no source of inoculum inside those cups, those trees were clean and cilids didn't have the opportunity uh, to, to use any inoculum that was there. Because the one instance that happened in 2017 was uh, when Irma, uh, Hurricane Irma uh, hit Florida, then those cups were significantly damaged and, and we get uh, cilids incursions and, and some infestations in those trees as well, which we were able to remove uh, through manual removal of the infested shoots and, and some spray applications. Uh, but still, uh, we, 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 we never found uh, HLB uh, in, in those trees. So this uh, study that we published uh, based on the data a couple of years uh, back in 2019, and that again, basically shows you the top graph here and the cilid populations. Uh, and, and you see that if you look for the first four bars, uh, you don't see any cilids in those cups until 2017 when the first cilid was found. And then later on, there were some in 2018, but then again, it went down and like I showed you the data from 2022 and 21, uh, that there were either none or very rare, uh, the ones we found. So then you can look at the CT values. This is the mayor of the disease HLB in the trees. And you see those CT values in the cups were very high, always well above uh, 32, uh, which was used as a, a threshold uh, for, uh, for for this study. And, but if you see outdoors after initial few years um, uh, in the open systems, and those uh, CT values were very low, suggesting that bacterial titers were very high in the trees that were uh, not protected with the cups. So like I said before, uh, none of these systems are, are uh, totally protected. Uh, these are some of the pests uh, uh, that we do uh, see in the cup systems. Uh, leaf miner is, uh, is the, uh, the one that we find most, uh, and, but still compared to what you see outside, uh, cups reduce its population uh, by more than 80%. But you do get those uh, leaf miner uh, populations in the cups. Uh, then there are some different species of scales <clears throat> that you will uh, find, uh, snow scales or Florida red scale or Caribbean black scale, some of the pictures I have here. And uh, it's, it's, it's tricky with some of these scales that you <clears throat> may not be able to get good control of them with the spray applications un unless you, uh, you are very careful and uh, uh, time your sp sprays really well, because I will give an example of this Florida red scale here. Uh, it is covered with the armor uh, and which, which protects their contact with the spray materials. So you may spray, but they, they may not get impacted. Uh, and the only time uh, the spray is really gonna uh, provide a good uh, suppression is uh, when the females are reproducing and their young ones are crawlers, 
uh, they come out and try to settle and before they develop their own armor. And that's a very short period and hundreds of crawlers <laughs> will be out and, and trying to establish. Otherwise uh, they are protected. And, and that's why uh, it becomes important to look at other uh, uh, tools or to, to target these pests. And one of them is uh, uh, biological control. And, and, and I have a postdoc who has been working on, on some of these issues for the past couple of uh, uh, years. And uh, I will show you an interesting slide after this. Uh, but then we also see some uh, infestations of uh, uh, flower thrips in there as well, and, uh, and mealybugs as well. Mites are a, a consistent problem, uh, especially citrus rust mite uh, and uh, citrus rod mite. Uh, I uh, had a student, she graduated last year. Uh, her whole project was on, on these pest and, and beneficial mites. So I'll sh share with you some data from uh, that as well. So speaking of uh, Florida red scale, uh, we have been working with different biological control agents. Uh, I will show you this example. Uh, this is one of the, uh, the lady beetle that I showed uh, in my early slides, uh, Curinus corallius. Uh, also very good predator of uh, Asian citrus psyllid. Uh, also good to withstand uh, Florida environment. Uh, we find it uh, even during very hot and humid months in the, in the citrus groves. Uh, and you can see how these larvae and the adults, uh, they were able to go and, and remove the armor uh, from the bodies of those scales and consume uh, them and, and their progeny uh, inside, uh, inside the armor. So both the adults and, and nymphs were, uh, the larvae were able uh, to do an effective job uh, of uh, targeting that uh, Florida red scale. And uh, we have recently published an article, uh, if you are interested, uh, it's in uh, uh, Bulletin of Entomological uh, Research. So uh, in terms of uh, pest mites, uh, uh, like I said earlier, uh, uh, Emily DeMart, she was uh, my PhD student and uh, she collected this data. So we see uh, the rust mite populations. Uh, this is the data for on, on the leaves. And, and interestingly, you see here uh, that the purple bar is the one for the cups and the dashed blue one is for the open air. Uh, and you see that, of course, the mites populations were much less in the cups uh, compared uh, to the outdoor system. But still, it's important to note that even for the fresh fruit, uh, these populations uh, can cause significant damage because they not only uh, target uh, the, the leaves, but they also target the fruit. And, and, and the effects that you get on the fruit uh, are not acceptable. Uh, uh, with those uh, symptoms for the fresh fruit uh, markets. So then we have another species, uh, citrus red mite, and uh, the situation here is reversed. So you see that the outside, the blue bar, the population of uh, these mites were less compared to the populations uh, inside the cups. And you see that uh, uh, the populations kept increasing uh, during different times of the year, uh, and somehow the cups environment was more uh, favorable uh, for, for its growth and, uh, and development. Uh, the interesting part was that we were also uh, finding uh, several species of uh, predatory mites, uh, which not only attack the pest mites, uh, but also uh, several uh, other pests, the younger stages of other pests as well. So here you see the listing of uh, uh, different species uh, that were found uh, and, and they were, uh, their abundance was not very different uh, compared to what we were finding outside, uh, uh, which is interesting because uh, uh, in, inside the cups, our hypothesis was that there may not be many because uh, the ground cover was, uh, there was no real ground cover that you get outside that you have grass and the weeds uh, which, which, uh, which support their populations. Uh, but still, uh, we did get very good populations of those predatory mites inside the cups. 
uh, especially the, the two abundant species were uh, Amblyceus, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Dematavensis, uh, uh, which was more abundant in the cups and then in the open air production systems. And then uh, we had uh, Tiflodromalus and Perigrinus, uh, which was also abundant in cups, but less compared to the uh, open uh, production systems. Uh, this this uh, just to show you again, basically the same data uh, where I have uh, actually Emily, she, she plotted uh, those data and, and that shows you that uh, Amblyceus tematomensis was uh, uh, in the cups uh, as well as in the open air, but more abundant uh, in the cups, whereas the tematomensis was more abundant uh, in the open air. But still, both species were uh, at, at, at high levels uh, inside the cups, suggesting uh, that, uh, that the cups environment uh, may be uh, suitable uh, for uh, and, and the predatory mites and, uh, and to do their job. So overall, uh, and I'm sorry, I forgot to mention on the previous slide uh, that beside these uh, predatory mites, uh, we have uh, found several parasites of these different pests that I mentioned uh, that were found in the cups. We were also finding, we were finding the parasites of uh, citrus leaf miner. Uh, we were finding the parasites of millibugs. Uh, we were finding the parasites of uh, Florida red scale. Uh, and uh, not as high as you would expect the level of parasitism, but still they were there and uh, they were causing uh, mortality of uh, those pests uh, to some level. So overall, uh, if we look at, uh, at, at, at what I presented, uh, I think we can say that foliar sprays of insecticides uh, time to citrus flushing provided significant reductions in cellulite populations uh, than the grower standard and uh, also a reduction in sprays. Although the data that I showed in 20 one, uh, there were five sprays in, in both uh, uh, the grower standard and in the, in the where we were timing the sprays to the flush. Uh, but the previous year, there were eight sprays in the grower standard uh, and six sprays when we were timing on the citrus flush. So even a spray of uh, a reduction of one or two sprays, uh, if, if, you, if you calculate uh, that saving in terms of acreage, uh, it, it becomes huge and, and, and saves uh, uh, growers uh, in terms of uh, protection and production costs. Uh, then uh, we did see that the predators, lady beetles and lacewings are, are, are there in the groves and, uh, and they contribute to uh, the nature mortality of uh, silhouette immatures uh, at reasonable levels. Uh, young citrus trees on uh, UV metallized reflective mulch uh, benefited from uh, reduced uh, psyllid populations uh, and improved uh, plant health. Uh, IPCs and the cups, uh, they protected citrus from the Asian citrus psyllid and HLB. Uh, however, the other pests uh, that I mentioned, such as citrus leaf miners, scales, thrips, millibugs, uh, army worms, uh, and, and mites, they were, they were found uh, uh, in those uh, protected structures. So pest monitoring is critical, uh, like I mentioned before, both for the IPCs uh, and for the cups, uh, uh, because we, you want to find those uh, pests at early stages uh, so that uh, uh, you can take some actions to, to knock them down. Uh, and and we, we have been test using different uh, methods and, and uh, it could be visual observations, the tap method, uh, the yellow sticky cards, they were all useful uh, in detecting the ACP or CLM uh, with pheromones and then scales, trips, and, uh, and mites. So uh, you can, you can make, make modifications to some of uh, uh, these methods, such as for the, for the tap sampling methods, we usually use uh, a white laminated sheet uh, when we are uh, doing sampling in the 
outside environment. Uh, but for the Emily's project, uh, we, we changed that uh, color of the sheet to black uh, to, to get the data on, 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 on some of the mite species uh, and, and, and particularly some of the predatory mites, uh, which are white or creamy white. Uh, the, the, you can get uh, a good visibility uh, with that dark uh, background. Uh, then CLM pheromones uh, traps provide a good information on the on the male activity, uh, and uh, like I said, parasites of uh, of several of those pests and small predators such as mites uh, that attack pest mites as well as uh, insect pests were also detected in the cups uh, and the sprays of insecticides and uh, miticides. Uh, when needed were used in those structures, uh, which uh, reduced the populations of pests, uh, but also reduced the populations of uh, beneficial uh, organisms such as beneficial mites, uh, but uh, they did not totally prevent pest population uh, from uh, increasing. With that, I would uh, I'd like to thank uh, several of the funded sources uh, over these years, um, the, the Citizen Research Board or Development Foundation from California and, uh, and Florida, uh, Florida Dep Division of Plant Industry, uh, federal uh, NIFA uh, grants uh, for our projects, uh, Baron Collier and Bob Paul uh, for allowing us to conduct some of the large scale studies in their groves. Uh, several other growers were also willing to support and uh, let us work in their groves. Several of these collaborators, either in terms of uh, uh, grants or, or student mentoring or uh, on the projects that I, I presented data uh, are involved in, in, in those different studies and uh, we appreciate their collaborations. Uh, members of my lab uh, that do all the hard work uh, Barry Caustic, my senior biological scientist, the postdocs, uh, Dr. Al Shami, Sabri, Ragno, uh, PhD students, Emily DeMard, uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, MSc students, uh, Jean Baris, uh, and then research assistants, uh, Monica Triana, Danny Pena, uh, Arian Hernandez, and uh, I, I may have missed some here, but because of several overlapping projects and uh, uh, but and thank you very much for your patience for for attending the seminar and uh, I will be glad to answer uh, any questions. Thank you, Dr. Qureshi.